Hello everyone and welcome to our special panel on understanding digital design. Um, this is going to be a student panel and we'll be discussing some of the current trends and the future opportunities for young people who are looking to embark on a new learning experience and creative career in their future. Um, but before we get started, um, Rohan, next slide please. Um, I'd like to do an acknowledgement for, uh, to country. Um, RMIT University acknowledges the people of the Wawarung and Boomerang language groups of the Eastern Kulin Nations on whose unceded lands we conduct the business of this university. And we respectfully acknowledge their ancestors and elders, past and present. Um, it's really important to us to do the, this kind of acknowledgement to country. And Rohan, and if you show the next slide, we also are really committed to engaging with um, Aboriginal elders and community members to actually collaborate on digital design projects. So I just wanted to kick off by showing you um, the Yalanguth app that's only just been released um, this month. And it's been made by a team of um, digital design uh, staff and students. And, and it's been in a collaboration with um, Indigenous elders um, including Jack, um, Uncle Jack Charles and Uncle, Uncle Bootsy Thorpe and Auntie Alma Thorpe. It's just an amazing um, app. So basically what it is is it's around the Indigenous stories and taking on um, extending the oral traditions. So when you go to, it, at the moment it's in Fitzroy along Gertrude Street and a lot of the alleyways along Gertrude Street, you simply download this app and as you walk through the streets, it automatically plays all these amazing stories being told by Indigenous elders. It takes you down to the streets where some of um, the some of the uh, amazing songs by Archie Roach were inspired, and just such such amazing stories. And you can you can spend hours just wandering around listening to them. And we're really hoping to extend um, this into other areas of the city and also into some of the parks surrounding um, Melbourne. So this is um, a commitment we make. And I also believe that the Yolongov app is a really great exemplar of what digital designers do in collaboration with other people. Because really digital design is just an excuse to bring people, places and things together. It's an interaction device. So um, this is why we really, really love this project um, and are really happy to be able to share it with you this month as it's just released. Um, Next slide, please. So um, this session is um, myself. I'm sorry, I'm Professor Deb Polson. I'm quite new to RMIT. I only in, um, joined at the end of the last year. Um, I'd been in uh, New Zealand. I'd uh, set up a new school of design for the University of Auckland, um, which is now well and truly running and successful. And now I'm back at RMIT, closer to home, um, working in with this fabulous team. And what we've got today is four fabulous students um, who are going to represent a couple of different practices that happen in digital design because digital design is such a broad um, a set of unique uh, roles and lots of different skills and methods employed by them. So we've got um, Martin, who will be introducing himself soon. And Martin is an animation second year student. And if I look to the side, it's just because I'm referring to my notes. This is what happens in class all the time. Um, so he's a second year student with a background in painting and illustration. Um, and he's come to RMIT to expand his, his skills and find new ways to create. And Martin will tell you a fabulous story about where he's off to. In a few months' time, he's just being made a fabulous offer and I can't wait for you to all to hear about it. We've also got Oscar, who's a second-year um, second digital design student, um, digital media student, and he's interested in user experience design, which is a really burgeoning field in design. Uh, we'll, I'll mention that again um, soon. And he has a background in music production and graphic design. And he's been working as a screen printer and creative director in a local business. And Oscar has just also been made a great um, opportunity from a local industry uh, who will be um, funding a project that he's just finished in second year. So he'll be telling you about that. And we have Cheryl. Cheryl's also a second year digital media student, but 
what's interesting is um, she will tell you quite a different story, even though she's doing the same program as Oscar in the same year level. Her focus is slightly different. And of course, we account for all of these things. So Cheryl is more interested in working towards creating accessible experiences with an interest in how different cultures engage and interact with digital platforms. And she's done some amazing work already in that area. And we have a special guest star with us, Leah. Leah is actually from industrial design, which is not traditionally known as a digital design field. But we've brought Leah along because she's naturally interested in how digital tools expand her practice as an industrial designer, who's normally works very much with tangible and fabricated um, prototyping. So um, Leah has... Um, has a background in theatre and graphic design. So you can see that our students come from a variety of different backgrounds with different interests and they adopt and adapt the teachings that we give them and the tools that they're introduced to to create their own career paths based on their own interests. And um, Leah has done some amazing work with, um, with an intersection between experience design um, and wearable technology around the areas of fitness. I can't wait for you to see their projects. Next slide, please, Rohan. And before you meet these students, I just wanted to sort of um, uh, explain to you that digital design at RMIT is a discipline with three main um, bachelor programs. So we have animation, game design, and digital media. And these kind of uh, uh, different areas of practice but of course, they quite often intersect and we get to do wonderful kind of collaboration projects across these. We also have a master's project program called MAGI, the Masters of Animation, Games and Interaction, um, which is also a great pathway. But here, um, but we also have in the School of Design a program called Communication Design, which has its traditions in graphic design um, and areas like that. And of course, it's growing into areas of digital in terms of interface design, service design and other areas. Um, and of course, we've also got industrial design. So um, these are the kind of programs we've got uh, running at the moment. And, of, and, they, um, and the students that we find in these three programs come from vastly different backgrounds and they all find a really great creative home here with us. So next slide, please, Rohan. So, I just want to, before we get started, I want to just talk to some of you there. Some of you might be parents, some of you might be students in year 9, 10, 11 or 12. And quite often when I go out and talk to schools, there's sometimes people aren't even aware of all the great opportunities in digital design at the moment. And at the you might see on the left-hand side here, we've got um, ones that you might be familiar with. So you've got graphic design, communication design, fashion design. These are sort of design um, disciplines that most people are familiar with. And when you're thinking about your careers, these are some of the search terms you might use in LinkedIn or Seek or, or somewhere like that to have a look at what's um, available and what's growing out there at the moment. But I also suggest to you that in digital design, we have like roles. In the last 10 years, we've gone through this huge renaissance in design. And not only have there become a whole bunch of different roles, but lots of different ways that we work now. And of course, with 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 them, um, COVID coming around, the um, ha having made huge changes on us, digital design is sort of made for that. And we've kind of been able to um, pivot and respond and adapt quite well. And a lot of these roles are becoming even more in demand. So we have roles like experience design, service design, um, product designer, which is quite different. Product design used to talk about only um, artifacts and physical things, but products, services, their campaigns, their digital apps. Um, and it's a great role, the product designer. This creative technologist, if I could do it all again, that's what I would be. Design strategist, concept artist. And there's even a term called generalist in games where you, you kind of have a, a, a general understanding of a whole bunch of different areas so that you can support teams in different ways. So there's lots of different ways. And if you go onto LinkedIn, for example, you could even do magic combinations of this. There, it's like you could look for creative interface simulation designer and you will find a job. So there's really, really interesting um, opportunities always growing in this area. But the interesting thing that we know and understand as the people teaching this area is that most of these jobs – well, especially in the ones in the middle one there, have a very similar set of tools that they use, similar methods 
and models. It's just that their intent, who they collaborate with, and maybe the context in which they work might be slightly different. So we try to make sure that students can find coursework within these programs that fits these sort of destinations that they might be looking for. And another thing that I just want to mention is that the important thing for a university program is to make sure that our graduates aren't just, you know, got skills in production software or hardware, but that they're creative team members, you know, that they contribute to teams in really unique and creative ways. But they're also strategic project leaders, so they can come up with great ideas, they can lead teams, they can understand audience, players and user behaviours, and they can plan for um, new kinds of interactions. But we also want to make sure that some of you are future game changers, and I think we have a few of them in um, our panel today. So these are the people who are going to who are going to look at the new technologies and look at the new practices, and they're going to find amazing new ways to improve people's lives. The other sort of pressure a little bit on digital designers at the moment, which I'm really excited about, is not only that they keep up to date with sort of all of the expanding new technologies, such as gaming tech and animation tech is always growing, and Martin will tell you a little bit about that. You know, it's not just the production technologies, but it's the display technologies. And also there's AI, digital money, crypto technologies, there's drones, there's all of these amazing technologies that we need to understand. We not only understand how they work, but the implications of their uptake. But we also need to understand the global challenges. And I have met a lot of young people in my my last few years um, uh, in going out to schools. And a lot of them are concerned with climate change, with increasing inequalities, social and cultural. Um, and so what we're also looking at is how digital designers contribute to some of the wicked problems so that students, when they graduate, they don't have to put aside the things they care about in order to work in these areas. So that's what's really exciting. So we make the promise to you that you learn about technologies, you learn about a lot of different ways and places to work, but you also learn about the impacts of design and how to do that in a way that does um, less harm. We've put enough things in the bellies of whales. So now we're really concerned with how we help to improve systems, interactions and cycles of production. So next slide, please. So it's just some background. So me, as I'm a digital designer and I have a forever love for it and I'm always picking up new things and new places. But it's also, this is just to show you that even in my kind of career in the last 10 years, well, this is actually only my projects in the last four years, I've kind of made virtual change rooms and virtual um, for shopping centres, uh, virtual mirrors. I've made a, you go into a spaceship, you design a fruit using um, plant biology. Uh, I worked with um, plant biologists and you create a piece of fruit using all of these different levers and then you print it with um uh, with edible materials in a printer with the nutrients you're lacking. Um, the other one is a wonderful, um, I recreated a Condolilla Falls walk in Queensland for people in wheelchairs, and that was a really emotional, beautiful and wonderful, very satisfying project. I also have worked with Marvel to create um, apps so that when people come across, um, especially in galleries and museums, objects, Marvel objects, they tell them stories about their origins I've also made magic mirrors with Iron Man and um, Groot and a number of other characters for Marvel. But I've also, my latest project is that I'm making a virtual reality for kids in hospital beds. So when they're in hospital, their room fills with water, their bed turns into a boat, and the other boats that they see are other kids in hospital beds, and they get to meet and play games together. So that's one of, that's just a range. So I work within hospitals, museums, I work with Marvel, I work with plant biologists. It's just about how you learn to um, work on behalf of a whole bunch of collaborators as a digital designer. So next slide, please, Rohan. So oh, introducing Cheryl. So maybe Cheryl, what I was going to ask you to um, talk about, Cheryl, was um, who you what was this project and who you collaborated with? Yeah. Hi, Deb. Um, so hi, everyone. Um, so the project on the right was a group project which involved like a lot of cross-specialization work where 
um, we had a group of four and everyone was specializing in something completely different, like sound, video, 3D animation, kind of. And um, I was in interaction and prototyping. And the project was basically creating a mobile app that helps to engage the visitors with Luna Park's rides. And I think like everything was super fun to do because you get to learn so many new things from people that have experience in different like parts of design as, as, a, as a whole. And the other two projects were technically my individual work, but there was a lot of collaborative effort put in to create the final outcome. And um, the one in the middle where I created um, it landmark icons, I talked to tutors, talked to friends just for advice on like technical work with Il Adobe Illustrator and just what I could do to make it look nicer. And that's how I got to the final outcome, which I was really proud of. And with the project on the left, which is Green Card, it was a mobile app that helps people discover new local sustainable businesses and helps them gain exposure and new customers. Um, I had the opportunity to collaborate with local, like real local sustainable businesses to help get more content from my prototype that I could showcase in my project. And I thought that was really cool because it helped me get like some insight into what actually working and collaborating with real people are like. So yeah, thank you. Thank you, Cheryl. Um, and I think Leah's up next. Next slide, please, Rohan. Hey guys. Um, so in industrial design, we have a major design studio that focuses on digital design. So for last semester, I worked in a group with Louis McGowan and we focused on designing a mobile healthcare application and wearable device uh, with the aim of improving I mean, and increasing support for physiotherapy patients uh, with their injuries and their rehabilitation journeys. Because what we found in the research was that um, patients really struggled to adhere to their um, home exercise programs. So we developed a mobile platform um, that made patients able to follow along with their home exercise program and using uh, this wearable device, it could provide real-time feedback on how well patients were, for example, squatting or doing their exercises. And it could provide improvements, provide feedback and all sorts of really cool stuff. Yeah. Thank you, Leah. I can't wait for that to become a reality. Um, <laughs> I could use it. Um, thank you, Leah. We'll talk a little bit more about um, how how new and emerging technologies has made this possible for you to engage with um, on a prototyping level because, um, you know, it's really interesting that you've been able to merge wearables with mobile devices, with physical um, fitness models. That's so fantastic. So Oscar, I think Oscar's next. Uh, Rohan? So Oscar... Um, can you tell us a little bit about the um, how this went from a studio project and now into reality and the types of collaborations you did and where you're going to next? I know that's a lot, but as much as you can. Thanks, Oscar. Yeah, oh, definitely. So I presented a T-shirt recycling design solution called Green Tea last semester, and it was selected by the industry partners ISPT uh, to work towards making it happen somewhere in Melbourne. Um, so recently I've just been working with ISPT and collaborating with Touch and Space Cube to try and get a physical location opened hopefully by the end of the year. Um, so I've just kind of gotten the poster from my presentation and also a little mock-up made by the guys at um, Space Cube. Mm. Um, and it's kind of surreal that it's gotten it this far because the... <gasps> Yeah, the original assignment was just based around what I was doing at the time. I was printing T-shirts in my garage, and I thought it would be interesting to base my assignment around that. And tell us a little bit, Oscar, about why and who will be involved with this, because part of this is you giving agency to some local creatives, right, through a digital interface and then a physical location. So maybe tell us a little bit about who and why you want to support with this project. 
Uh, yeah, so I've done a lot of work previously with um, a lot of local graphic designers and I thought it'd be cool to have a little platform for them to uh, monetize their work. So for them to submit t-shirt graphics and have them sold and kind of make some money out of that and help support their art. Fantastic. And you're also looking at recycling and reusing. Is that the term you use in terms of it's also you're also con- con- um, concerned about the um, sustainability of of T-shirt production and supply? Yeah, so I've kind of focused on getting people to try and bring their old T-shirts in and get them re reprinted and recycled, but also trying to collaborate with um other companies and and op shops and just to reduce waste and kind of get these t-shirts back in circulation fantastic well people should watch out for the green tea at some local um centers before around christmas time congratulations oscar um and now we've got martin um martin oh can you tell us a little bit about where you were at before and what your journey at RMIT has been and where it's taken you? Um, and, yeah, and maybe tell us a little bit about your big news. That would be great. <laughs> uh, hello, everyone. Um, first of all, can I just say, Deb, I really want to try some of your futuristic fruit. Uh, it sounds great. Yeah. Um, and also, I would love to catch up with Oscar because I would love to make some T-shirts. That would be cool. Um, but yeah, hello, I'm Martin. Um, where I was before RMIT, um, my background is mostly in sort of like illustration and painting and murals and things like that. Um, but I also found myself in this sort of boring but well-paid like government job and um, just wasn't wasn't into it. So I thought I'd like come to RMIT and try to upskill and move my work into like you know um just like different direction and you know um that kind of thing so yeah um what i i'll just talk through what i have on the screen if that's okay deb yeah um yeah so on the left hand side here uh is um something we did just last semester actually uh, it's a piece of work made in a piece of software called houdini which is sort of um kind of the thing you want to learn if you're getting into sort of visual effects um, or computer generated imagery, just like in general. Um, I hadn't really heard about it before coming to RMIT and everything I read and everything I was told was that you want to learn this program. So uh, I did and um, I was pretty like happy with like what I made. This is sort of a recreation of a painting that I had made a couple of years prior. super complicated but that's what it looks like at the end um in the middle here is just like a painting i did as a commission for someone so i sort of paint these like uh sort of strange characters uh in uh sort of alien worlds um i try to focus really heavily on sort of like rendering and color and lighting and that kind of thing uh and then on the uh, right hand side is a still from a 3d animation that i made last semester as well um just as part of our sort of 3d class um yeah um but what what would you say i should say next deb well let me let me um (laughs) so i mean it's really hard to actually describe the the wonder of that um, the painterly VR project that you did, um, Martin, because it is fully three D. Like it's this is this wonderful new opportunity for us to be new creative tools in order to be able to take traditional painting techniques and bring them into virtual environments. In it's complicated at the moment, but the exciting thing about this. It, Martin, um, you can you can finish the story, but I'll start it. Is that you know one thing we like to do, like with Oscar's class, where I brought my industry partners in, so that um, Oscar uh, the the class got exposure to that. In Martin's class, a wonderful lecturer called Gina, her she has such great um, uh, relationships with people in the industry, and she had a, a um, someone in Sony who. Um, runs a, uh, the creative animation section there, Pav. And and he spent, was it six hours a week, Martin? He came to studios 
to all of the studios with Gina. He um, was streamed in from, L is he in L Vancouver or is it LA? He's in Los Angeles. He's in Los Angeles. So he joined Martin's class from Los Angeles every week to teach them exactly what he'd, a process he'd invented at Sony in order to make Spider-Verse. Is that right? Am I telling the story right, Martin? Um, I mean, pretty much. Uh, we we used a part of a tool that he had made to um, make uh, sort of a procedural colouring tool um, that was part of a larger tool that he'd used or invented, I suppose, uh, in this Houdini software um, that uh, procedurally created a bunch of uh, stuff, visual effects in Spider-Verse. Um, so we really got... Uh, some great insights into how to kind of like use this software uh, in various ways. But it was also very um, sort of fundamentally interested in colour and value. So it wasn't super technical. Um, it was very much considering the artistic outcomes of this really technical software, um, which is a cool thing to do because you are, you're, what you wind up with at the end is this beautiful thing. Um, but you've learned all this stuff that is not particularly beautiful. It's all very technical. Um, yeah. So anyway, yeah. The, the, the end result was that we spent all semester making this thing and uh, Pav at the end of semester kind of said, well, uh, I'm really impressed with the work that everyone's made. Um, perhaps you'd like to come and work for Sony Pictures and uh, work on the new Spider-Verse film. Uh, so a bunch of us, um, he made the offer to everyone. We all sort of applied for an interview. Uh, I was lucky enough to get that interview uh, and also get the job. So um, I, I, I'm technically a third year student, but I've kind of got a leave of absence at the moment because I'm moving to Vancouver to work at Sony Pictures Imageworks. Uh, Congratulations. Thank Martin. you. And I believe one other student's going as well, another student... Yes, another third year is going. Um, I've not actually met them. We've been talking online. Um, but, yeah, it feels very, like, odd just saying it out loud. I haven't even graduated yet, and I've got this sort of, like, weird industry job. So um, it's possible. That's fantastic. So, I mean, what I like about this is not only learning the tools, but you're learning it not only from the experts that are in the teaching team, but we bring in people to make sure that it's constantly um, right on the money in terms of what tools are being used, what processes, and also people to design for, like in Oscar's case and, and Leah's and Cheryl's, where it's not just about the technology we're being taught, but we're taught how and who to design for. Um, and, and that's what's really interesting. This has been great, but we've I've got some questions coming through. I did have some questions of my own, but I'm going to skip straight to questions I'm getting from the audience, guys. So um, some of it is, and maybe, I mean, I could answer it, but maybe Cheryl, um, there's a question here on how COVID-19 has impacted design industry and how it's, maybe you could uh, answer this second part. How has it changed the way students learn and study at RMIT? Yeah, like I think for me personally, I it was just really hard transitioning for like the first few weeks of lockdown, I think. But I think everyone in RMIT is very supporting, I mean, supportive and along with all the tutors as well. And I think we have like a large group chat with everyone in the degree. So I think everyone um, can talk with each other if they need to. And I think with design specifically out like there's so many tools available for us I think it's really easy to get around and like transitioning to working from home basically like we have so many tools available to us to still collaborate with everyone else so yeah thanks Joe and I think one of the things that we did when the lockdown first happened is we all of us called our friends in the industry and asked them how they were going to be making this um, change to online as well and we we've started to, we've tried to make sure we're making using the same communication tools so game design students use discord for us to keep in contact um, and and we've got a lot of different digital tools and we try to make sure that we're using the tools that match the cohort and match the industry in which they're going to so we had to very quickly bring in some new tools and some new ways for us to teach and to communicate, but most importantly, to allow students to still work with each other. 
Um, Because what we found with going online was there was a lot of online delivery of teaching, but what we weren't doing so well at the beginning was how the learning and engagement of learning was happening, and we've got a little bit better at that. But I I think that we're trying to – we're definitely – aligned to how industry is responding to this too. And there's not too much of a disruption for us in this in terms of digital practice can go digital quite quickly. It's just our access to our communities that we work for and the um, industry that we work with. But we've tried to make sure that we've kept that relationship going too. I think in some cases, like in Martin's, and being online means that we can engage with people who aren't in Melbourne much more easily and much more naturally. So it's actually broadened the community for us. Yeah, do, totally. Do I, any of you want to say something else to that? Uh, well, just on that point, I felt like during COVID, I uh, got to know more people online, uh, like more classmates than I did sitting in sort of a lab where I'd just know the people who was kind of sitting next to me. Um, like it's kind of ironic, I guess. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, you know, we're prepared for this to be in and out and that the harder thing was coming in and out, but we've got a lot better at that too now and a lot quicker. We tried not to adjust the learning too much, but we definitely adjust what we expected in assessments and submissions, but we feel like the students were super determined and super engaged and we really... In the end, our expectations didn't need to be adjusted at all when the work is just as high quality. Um, There's some other questions. Um, Leah, what should I do to prepare before coming into into studying something like digital design? Do you have any specific advice? I think specifically find what you're interested in. Just really go and have a deep dive into what, makes you excited and one of the really amazing things about industrial design and the design um, fields is you really can tailor that to your interests. I don't think you need to stress too much about preparing. It's not like you need to read a science book or anything. It's just follow what you're passionate about, have some fun and especially in first year it's all just about getting you creating. I love that, Leah. Oscar, have you got anything to add to that? Um, Yeah, I think just be as open-minded as possible. And you don't really need, I mean, this technical skills aren't really as important as they might seem. It's just more important to be open-minded and try stuff. I think that's such important advice because... I think what um, a lot of people I meet an open day when we're normally meeting, a lot of parents and young people, is they feel like they need to have skills or knowledge before they even join. And and really, this is where you start that journey. And so really, it's the passion that Leah was talking about. It's having an interest. And you don't have to put your own interests aside to do digital design. If you have an interest in music, sound, festivals, retail, you what you do your digital design practice within those interests so for me it's like it's it's about bringing yourself to this and being opened to having your mind changed or being distracted I'm not sure if Leah knew she was going to be doing a fitness app before she started I certainly didn't think I was going to be making a fruit simulator when I started working so I think it's really that's such terrific advice And there is a question here about, I want to get into design industry, but my confidence is not great. What advice can you give me? What would you say, Martin? Um, I think your confidence will come through the work that you make. Um, Yeah, so, uh, yeah, that's that's all I can really say. Um, It's, I think it's uh, natural to feel a little bit like intimidated or scared about um you know applying uh but i i don't know i think if you're i think having an interest number one is like probably the most important thing and as you build uh and make work um your confidence will just grow naturally so yeah that's what i would say that's great advice and you know for me like and the range here is like I, I look at rohan and he's got i mean i look at martin and he's got these amazing illustration skills and I work in design and I'm not an illustrator, right? So 
I don't try to beat myself up about not having confidence in illustration. I find my other strengths and other interests. And my one of my um, expertises is coming up with, with models to evaluate how well my design is working so that I can really constantly tweak it into the best thing it can be. I'm really forensic with how I test my prototypes. So I, th I think that's what's really interesting. Don't Sometimes a lack of confidence comes from um, having expectations to have skills or know-how in particular areas, but it might not be your jig, you know? So I think it's about that. I think um, some of the thing that might be worth mentioning though is really to have confidence and to be interesting, you have to be interested, right? And you have to be active. So keep journals, draw. And, you know, um, for, il for um, animation and games, you, you do have, um, I think an entry requirement is to have a portfolio um, in digital media, it's not. Digital media is an ATAR score. So there's different ways through. Um, and so, and what we really look for in a portfolio, and especially because doing a digital design degree is all about building a portfolio and building a professional language and process around your work. So part of the portfolio that we teach is you don't just show finished work. You show your sketches on, on serviettes. You show your photographs that inspired you. You show... Um, drawings and experiments, um, mock-ups, you show the whole process. So when you're thinking about building your confidence, your your skills might be different in a different part of the process of design. You might be really good at prototyping or mocking up or research. Um, so your, your folio should show all of these different interests in it. Um, Someone's asked a question about how many games do game design students make. We don't have any game design students here, but I teach into games and I'm teaching the capstone unit. And, oh, my God, I'm starting to see all their games evolve. And their games are so different. Um, they make – some of the games I'm seeing are sort of 3D games that look like, you know, in spaceships that look like something like Doom. Other ones are very personal narrative stories and some of them are side-scroll puzzle, puzzle games. There's so many different aesthetics – and styles of games to be made. And you make a lot of games. Um, there's one particular studio where you make a game every two weeks, a game of Fortnite. Um, and basically the studio um, technicians and lecturers help you um, focus on a particular uh, type of skill or effect each time you do that. You do a lot of making in games and it's fantastic. But you also learn about game cultures. You learn about um, game communities. You learn about um, technical art. You learn about, pro, you know, creative coding. And you can specialise in all of these degrees. There are specialisations that you can take. So, for example, in digital media, you can go down the experience design route or the virtual reality route. In, um, in, in animation, you can go down 2D or 3D or visual effects. So there are different specialisations. So that's a really great question. Um, in front of industry. Oh, yes. Um, Games, definitely. The games uh, students, we bring in games, um, people in the games industry all the time to see their games. And that's usually what we're, what we're always trying to do is reduce the gap between you graduating and you working or freelancing as effectively as possible. But yeah, we've, Melbourne's got some amazing game um, uh, game studios, freelancers, independents, but all, all across Australia. And we bring our friends from all over the world into these classes as well. So that's a great question. Man, there's a really good question here for you. Um, hello, I am in a full-time job currently and wanted to ask Martin if there was a specific catalyst that convinced himself to take the leap of faith to pursue further studies. Great question. Ooh, what was the defining moment? <laughs> um, I think it was actually like a series of small, very boring moments that led me to the decision that like I can't keep doing what I'm doing. Um, and I needed to, uh, like find a path that had more of a future that I could see myself being in. Um, that's the main thing. Um, yeah, I, it was a really, like, it was a well-paid job. I was looking at, like, I was in a position to buy a house, uh, if I wanted to, but then it's like, do I really want to like do that? No, absolutely not. So, um, yeah, I think just like looking at the future, uh, five years ahead, where do I want to be? Do I want to be here? Absolutely not. So, <laughs> yeah, that's what it was. Um, 
and I happen to know one of the lecturers in the animation degree at RMIT. So I, I chewed his ear off a little bit, just sort of like asking questions. Should I do this? Should I do that? What do you think? Will my, will my work, you know, work in this area? Um, yeah, but I just, I, I have to say, I did go into it just with like an open mind, um, not really sure what would come of it uh, in the end. I just wanted to get some more skills, even if they just fed back into the work I was already making, like I was happy if just that was the outcome. Um, but instead I'm on this like completely un, unknown path now. I never saw Canada in the future um, and here we are, so yeah. I mean, Martin, you think about it. You made that d difficult decision before you start, and that wasn't that many years ago, and now you're going to be working in Spideyverse with Sony. I, I mean, this isn't, you know, studying is, is about upskilling yourself, but it's also about creating professional networks, for, you know, and it's and it definitely makes a, a, a difference um, to you, especially if you've got a passion, and most people in design have a passion for it. There's some other great... Um, questions here. Um, so someone's asking about how many students there are in each class, especially in games. So for example, in the capstone final year of games, there's 60 students, but no students are ever in a class bigger than 24, 25. Um, and we have in each of those groups, we have a technical mentor and a design mentor. And what happens is we bring groups together with students who have focused on coding, with students who have focused on art and students who have focused on sound. So um, students get to choose their focus fairly early in their design and then we bring them together um, to work on that. But we, we have a policy around keeping our class, our studios um, small um, and our ratio of teachers to students um, quite tight. Um, just because we do studio practice, which means we're working together constantly um, on projects. So that's a good question. Um, oh, I'm not very familiar with with software like Adobe and, and things like this. Leah, did you, did you feel like you needed to learn the software before you entered or did you, uh, it, or did it start you at the basics? I think, hmm, you definitely learn at the start of first year. Um, depending on which design stream you're in, it'll um, depend which type of Adobe programs you use. Mm -hmm. um, RMIT really in that first year helped me go from beginner to intermediate um, in things like Illustrator, Photoshop, InDesign, Premiere Pro, um, and also XD. So now I'm like really well versed in five or six different programs and that's all in the space of one or two years. So yeah, it's pretty good. Thank you for that. And it's, um, it's really interesting too. There's some questions here about, um, um, so, so Oscar, there are some of the questions are what kind of software you use mostly and has that changed since you've been there? Can you answer that one? Um, I spend probably most of my time in Illustrator, mm. if not all my time in Illustrator. And I think it's I've just kind of from the start just gotten mm. into Illustrator and Photoshop. But like I've tried most of them and I've just kind of stuck on Illustrator, but I should I'm looking forward to kind of going through the other ones. Like I've just started in design and you kind of learn as you go with all. Excellent. And and can how, maybe Cheryl, Oscar, you might know this a little bit, but do you know how sound production comes into play with some of these courses? Uh, I know that we have a very strong sound design um, specialization in digital media. So sound designers can, can concentrate on sound design. So sound for film, sound for games, sound for virtual environments. Have you taken any sound courses? I did in first year, I did, um, I did a couple specialization, one or two specialization mm -hmm. sound design courses because I thought that's what I would be most interested in. But um, I kind of did them and wasn't as interested as I expected and mm. had moved my focus somewhere else. But there's definitely pathways that you can take for sound design in this course. 
Yeah, I think for me, I also did the first year sound design course and I thought the content was really interesting, but it wasn't necessarily for me. But this semester I'm doing a subject called digital narrative where people have very individual projects, but some people want to implement sound. So they're getting to collaborating with sound design students to work together to produce something and it's beneficial for everyone. Yeah, do you remember the um, the swing project in digital media where we were going to work with industrial designers to create these swings and sound designers because the swings were going to have rules of how how people swung and what would, which ones they were in would determine how sound loops would play. So they would create um, sound compositions through playing on these different pieces of equipment. So we, we really do have what I call extreme collaborations, which is sort of sound with a fabricator, but we also have very con sort of um, corresponding collaborations where you would have sound design working with game students in order to create sounds for games um, and also in apps because sound design has such an impact on projects. Um, it's a really great thing. There's a question here um, around looking for work. I can't find it again because it's quite scroll, but Partly, um, I'm not sure what happens in industrial design and animation, but in digital media, there's a very large internship program in the final year where um, students do do a lot of internships, but also we bring in industry to do major project work. So you do work with, with, in, um, with them. So there's a lot of kind of exposure to opportunities. Um, but how are you all feeling about your prospects of work? Um, I'll start with, well, Martin, whatever. But I'll start with uh, Leah. Um, what, what, how do you feel about where you want to be and what kind of work you want to go for and how confident are you in pursuing that? Um, I've been very pleasantly surprised. Um, just this year, even amongst all the lockdowns and stuff, I was able to get a job working for an art and technology company um, that focuses on things like light up seesaws and swings as well. And that was through RMIT, through a tutor um, that I um, did a studio with. And that's been amazing. And on the other hand, there's things like Sidekicker with RMIT, where you can be a student and you can get jobs through this um, platform working in graphic design and stuff. So I've done that as well. And it means after you complete one of those jobs, you potentially get continuing work. Um, yeah, it's been really good. I think especially in the studios and tutorials, that's where a lot of opportunity comes for getting future jobs and networking and stuff. That's great because there are departments in RMIT whose sole jobs is to find part-time work for students um, and, and things like that. And there's also a lot of accelerator programs, like uh, some students are getting funding to take their projects um, onto other things. So there's lots of kind of pathways and of course, there's also this grad, like you know, an honours in industrial design and there's um, grad certs and masters and PhD pathways as well. But I think that in digital design, there's a lot of questions around the jobs, not only vision in the job market and an absolute kind of diversity of types of roles, but the these are these are well uh, it, it sounds ugly to say it but these are well paid roles like an experienced design role is much more senior to a graphic design role and a senior designer is is it, an, a, an experienced designer is not just thinking about the production of the graphics but they're thinking about what is the experience interaction with this what is the onboarding process of someone finding an app and onboarding it so there's not only these incredibly new roles but these roles allow for um, not just a focus on production, but a focus on analysis and creativity and um, and storyboarding and researching and using, you know, working with cognitive psychologists to come up with great ways to make people have more fun or engage with products better. You know, there's and service design is about how um, digital design tools and processes can help the service industry. So, for example, how do we help nurses um, interact with patients better or how do we create service design that helps like like I'm doing at the moment that helps um, uh, um, young people on the autism spectrum on board an ambulance 
Um, so we're, we're, we're finding all these ways to do this kind of work, which is really interesting. So it's not only that there's so much work in it, it's a diversity of work and it's an explosion in the types of activities that are done there. Um, let's see, we might have time for one more question. Um, there are some questions around the, um, the work to be done on folios and things, but there is a selection panel um, talk in open day where they'll be able to help you a lot more with this. I'm, I'm hoping that um, someone has put that in the chat for you all to see that there are other sessions in selection panels and they will help you put those things together. But one thing I really want to stress and I might get each of the students to give a closing statement is that digital design, people start and um, their student life from all walks of life and they start their student lives with different experiences. And even though there's um, a, a collective learning experience, students find their own pathways through that with their own experiences. And they come out at the end curious, confident and capable um, and also flexible. So, you know, it's these are not the days of where students will come out and have that one job for the rest of their lives. In fact, um, the World Economic Forum said, in, I think it's 2018, that 65% of students in, in high schools now will have jobs we've never heard of. So that scares some people, but that totally excites me. And it means that, you know, one of the skills that students need to have is the ability to keep on learning, you know, that and as a digital designer, you learn forever, and that's actually the joy of it. So hopefully that inspires you a little bit, but we might close um, with maybe asking a question of uh, maybe what are some of the advances in technologies or some of the global challenges that interest you guys the most and, and maybe how that makes you see your future differently? I know that's a lot of questions in one, but I, 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 might, I might start with Cheryl, because you're smiling. Cheryl, what, and how does that change the way you see your future? Like I think with where technology and yeah, technology is going in general, there's so many new things that are being developed all the time. So I think I'm just really inspired, like especially with Martin going to Sony and everything. I think like there's so many different possibilities that are out there that I couldn't, I can't possibly pick one thing that I would be really interested in because I think I'm just like open to the idea of just looking at whatever oh like whatever route I take in the future. Yes and I think because you're all in second year too this is still an experimental phase of your journey right so this yeah. is where you just are all in taking full advantage <laughs> of the assignments to create portfolio work and it's really you know this will unfold over time. Oscar what are you hoping for the future? Um, yeah, I've kind of got a similar standpoint as Cheryl. I'm sh quite open-minded to see what happens um, and just interested to see how the workforce progresses past um, coronavirus-related um, restrictions and remote working and remote learning and everything that's changed since then. Definitely. Well, I think you you have a lot of different pathways, Oscar, because you do do your work, which is, you know, which always intersects between the digital and the physical. So you're going to be adapting between trying to do sort of trying to still inspire sort of uh, local communities through digital practice. So there's such a there's such a big um, demand for that post COVID. I think you know um, you know getting people more reinvigorated with place and community is going to be such a important job for so many. There are some questions about jobs in animation um, and games. Look, there is always jobs in animation and games. Um, it's, it's a never, never ending opportunity. There's um, even um, recently and some, uh, what, what's his name, Martin Elliott, who does the wonderful stop motion um, works, uh, movies, have just got a big movie greenlit, a big stop motion animation studio is going to be opening up in Melbourne as a result to work on some feature length films. So there's always things happening. So Leah, what's some of your, um, um, what's the, because with your project where you were looking at 
um, mobile apps. I mean, augmented reality is going to change that again. So what you've learnt by doing that is what you've learnt is, is how the digital and the um, physical movement and human movement uh, can be can be integrated. But of course, technology will make that easier for you. Have you thought about how augmented reality might change that? I think augmented reality is certainly getting bigger. I haven't focused too much on that yet, hopefully in future studios. Mm. Um, I think it's just really exciting how much, like how many different um, technologies are emerging and like all the possibilities, especially in industrial and product design that there is now. Um, and especially just the potential for using this new tech that's emerging for like social innovation, healthcare design, um, and all that sort of stuff. It's really just exciting. And that's why I chose um, the course at RMIT that I did, because it gives you the potential to really play around with that and explore it. I just, I, it's been, this panel has been great to be able to talk to you all a little bit more and learn more about what uh, the work you do and the aspirations you have and these wonderful futures you have in front of you. It's been an absolute privilege for me and I can't wait to see you all in class again soon. Um, so we we might close up there, but I might ask if um, Kylie could, I don't know if you've already shared the email address, the design email address um, with the audience because there are some questions we haven't been able to get to, but if they send those questions directly to that email address, they will get an answer. We have a wonderful team um, in design that supports the academic work. Um, so maybe if Kylie can share that. Oh, excellent. She has shared that. So please feel free to do that. And also, could we just, there's been a, a question about people being able to see your work. Do any of you have an Instagram account or um, a Pinterest, or, oh, that's so old school of me. How about a MySpace? Um, do, do, do any of you have a way for some of the people here to be able to find you, Martin? Yeah, I've got a website. It's, um, it's basically my name. So it's Martin and then Eva Edward. That's my dorky middle name. Uh, and then Wills, W-I-L-L-S dot com. Fantastic. Leah, do you have anywhere that people can keep up to date with your work? I also have a website, but it's currently getting updated. So oh, it's a, problem a bit mysterious the right now. But, <laughs> but we might collect your profiles. And if someone sends an email asking that again, we can pass that on. But Oscar or Cheryl, was there any profile you wanted to share with, with the attendees? Um, I I have a folio on, I have a folio website as well, but it's kind of long, so I might just type it in the chat if that's all right. That's a great idea. <laughs> yeah, I, and I, I, we do have, we will have a website on the grad show coming up as well that um, we'll, we'll be able to share as well. Oh, thanks, Cheryl. Um, and yeah, and I have a website called debpolson.com. That's where you can see some of those projects as well. Um, but thank you so much for everyone who joined us. And I'm, I apologise if you didn't get your question answered, but I hope that this panel gave you a bit of a understanding of the broad um, d digital design family of, of, of activities and skills-based and the amazing different futures and pathways that it can give you both as a student and as a graduate. So thank you so much to my um, my um, panel members and to the people behind the scenes who have helped us with this. It was a really enjoyable session. So thanks very much, everyone. Bye, everyone. And now we do the Teams wave. <laughs> See you later.